Coming up on Push to Talk, how releasing games has changed. Also, the entirely new Ghost Recon Breakpoint, the follow-up to 2017's Ghost Recon Wildlands. Monster Hunter World Iceborne has been announced and looks pretty chill. Final Fantasy VII Remake is also upon us and looking real snazzy. All that and more on today's show. This is Push to Talk, episode 23, recorded Sunday, May 12, 2019. This episode is brought to you by Audible. Audible is offering our listeners a free audiobook with a 30-day trial membership. Just go to audibletrial.com slash push to talk and browse the unmatched selection of audio programs. Then download a title for free and start listening. Hey everybody, welcome back to another episode of Push to Talk. I am one of your hosts, Jan, and along with me are Bill and Joe. Hey guys, how's your week been so far? Uh, Good, very good, nice. How about yours? It's been pretty good. Should we mention it is Mother's Day in Canada and the U.S. and many countries around the world today, so it is a family-filled weekend. In fact, I have my folks visiting for the entire next week, so it is going to be a slightly less game-filled upcoming week, <laughs> but uh, we've certainly got a lot to talk about from the past week. For sure. Bill, how's your? Uh, how, how was your week? My week was good. Um, I'm going to say the same thing I say all the time, which is I don't really remember much of it, um, and I'm not a big drinker. I'm going to put that out there. Um, I just kind of go through the motions from uh, day to day, but uh, I believe I had a good week. Yeah. And um, I was going to comment that I feel like Mother's Day, there's a lot of holidays that get fragmented, you know, like the Canada and U.S. celebrating Thanksgiving on different days and things like that. Um, and, you know, we have employees all over the world in our jobs and, and they're always celebrating different weird holidays on different weird days. But Mother's Day seems pretty universally like everybody just went, yeah, that seems fair. We should just give mothers their own day and just agree on it and move on. Mm-hmm. I feel like I heard earlier today that in the UK, Mother's Day is on a different date, but I could have been mistaken. Hmm. I don't know about that. We'll have to look into that. Well, at least they do it at all. I, I think that is universal. Yeah, I think everybody pretty much appreciates their moms, which is a good thing. Yeah, culturally, I'm I'm satisfied. That's, yeah, that's good. So this past week, uh, we've been playing lots of games. We're switching up the order of our topics a little bit here so that we can dive right into what we played the last week. And I don't know. Bill, do you want to start? Like, you and I both played a lot of the same stuff, which is Destiny 2, but they actually came out with some interesting stuff this week. Yeah, yeah, we did. And it's not boring, Destiny. Um, it was... Uh, so the the best part about Destiny is when you're reading online and there's been an update and all of a sudden you start to see that something is happening. And that's all. That's how it begins for you and I. Something is happening and we that we realize this. And excitement grows because what is it? What does it do? What is it going to be? Um, in this case, uh, Destiny released a secret exotic quest called Outbreak Perfected. Well, I don't think that's what the quest is called, but that was the reward. That's what the reward, um, the gun is called, yeah. Yeah, and I will say that... It took us, I believe, two nights to get it, Um, Mm -hmm. probably five to seven runs of the mission to complete the mission because it was a very hard mission. But I was very surprised and very um, satisfied with how long it took us to get this thing and how difficult it was and very proud that our, you know, three man group was able to overcome it without bringing in a ringer. There's been uh, another quest in the past, the Whisper. Uh, quest, which was also similar to that, but it took us a little longer to get that one. So yeah, I do feel like we've accomplished something pretty special on this with uh, getting it done really the first time three of us got together to attempt it. Um, yeah. So Outbreak Perfected is the Destiny 2 version of a pulse rifle from Destiny 1. It was referred to as Outbreak Prime then, and, and even in Destiny 1, it was associated with a pretty cool, unique kind of quest that had a lot of math involved and lots of steps. With this one, like you said, it just became one of those things where someone in the community said, guys, I, I found a thing, there's a new door, and it's locked, and then I figured out how to open it, and it kind of goes from there, which usually happens while I'm at work in the office, and it's one of those days where I can't wait to get home. <laughs> yeah, Destiny has the unique ability to to do that, and this is why I always kind of, like, when you get to the point where you're like, I can't, I can't do it anymore, I can't you know, pump my time into destiny anymore. Um, I feel that too. I just 
know that eventually they're going to hit that home run again. Like there's going to be a lot of boring baseball in between those home runs, but um, Mm -hmm. yeah, that when they get it right, they get it very, very right. So um, yeah, that was about the only destiny I played though. Yeah. And they, I think they learned some lesson for the whisper from the whisper quest last time as well, because they managed to make this one a little bit more approachable. Uh, There wasn't any sort of strange time limited access to getting started on the quest pretty much anybody could do it it did require you to have completed some previous world quests on titan one of the planets um but for the most part if you played destiny 2 for a while you've done that and if not it probably only took you less than an hour to catch up to that point where you were able to start it and and after that it wasn't wasn't terribly complicated you know it, it was not a huge barrier to entry now completing it did require a certain level of skill and coordination which is good because that's what you want out of an exotic quest but yeah. what I really enjoyed there was no no level of randomness at all there was really nothing it had to do with luck of any sort you know it was based on if you had the skill and the willingness to put some time into it you could get it done it yeah. wasn't one of those scenarios that I really truly dislike about destiny where a lot of times it's just like, okay, let's all do it, and then maybe we'll get something. And this is where we get the opportunity to to uh, to laugh at our friend Sam, because um, Sam is a very, very, I would I think we would agree, he's a very highly skilled, highly knowledgeable Desti- Destiny player. It just comes naturally to him. And he was very, he laughed at the weapons that we used and some of the, the options that we took to beat this quest. But right. We, what I think we did is that, and this is important in Destiny as far as I'm concerned, is we played with the weapons and the configurations that worked for our skill set. Because you can't just take the single weapon that everybody believes is the only weapon that can get the job done and approach every problem the same way. And I think that if that's the way that Bungie designs these quests, that's rather boring. So we um, basically used, um, you know, configured our subclasses and our loadouts and things like that to complement each other and to make sure that we had coverage where we needed it and use the weapons that worked but were comfortable with. And that was, it was honestly just a very well done thing by Bungie from start to finish in that the quest was interesting. It wasn't too long, like you said. It wasn't random. Uh, and it wasn't as if you had to approach the problem the same way. Like it, it, if you didn't mm-hmm. have the whisper, you could beat it. Right. Yeah. And, that's and different and from we, other content. We got to actually figure it out. Uh, we got to be part of the, the process of solving this unknown, which a lot of times Destiny 2 community is so good at solving puzzles that sometimes by the time you get a chance to try it, there's already guides there. And the temptation just to look up the solution is strong. And um, it was kind of fun in this one to like the first two or three runs that you and I did together were just a matter of how far can we get. This is a timed quest at the end, so you have 20 minutes to complete it. And for us, it was just a matter of how far can we get? Where do we jump? Where do we go from here? Do we go left? Do we go right? What the hell is Trevor? You know, and <laughs> uh, it was really fun to figure that out. It was one of my biggest gripes with the raids that the way that Bungie has introduced them in the past, because for me personally, I really enjoy the puzzle solving and the trying to get into it and trying to figure stuff out and looking for secrets. And I feel this time I got the opportunity to do that. And and it's not because I've been grinding Destiny 2 for three hours a day for the past, you know, three months, which I haven't. We've talked about this before. We've played a little bit, but so it, it was accessible to everybody for the most part. I mean, if you've been playing anyways, and it is an end game kind of quest, but it was more accessible than anything they've done before. And it seems layered because it looks like there's additional things that uh, are involved with this in some way, shape or form, which are more complicated, which is great because there's that entry level that lets us get in there and enjoy something. But then there's also going to be that complicated, you know, uh, requires code breakers to come in and and solve the problem um, aspect to things that sort of seems to exist separate and after the quest. And I think that's a, well, that's a good way of doing it. Like give something that everybody can enjoy and then give something that is ridiculously difficult, but it's not, you know, it's not the main attraction, so to speak. So, but yeah, so I, as you know, I've been playing uh, a lot of Destiny 2 with with that quest. Uh, and the one other thing I've been playing that I wanted to mention, I've been playing the Steadfast Ranger update from The Long Dark, um, which I know I'm the only person here, I think that plays The Long Dark, um, or at least as consistently is what I do. I think you play it when there's when there's a reason or new content. Um, yeah, I'll probably play it again when episode three is released. Yeah, I suspect that'll be this year, but they've obviously not announced anything. But uh, Steadfast Ranger for me has been 
it's been a bit of a, a rough entry uh, back in after taking maybe a month off of the game. Um, a couple of mechanics changed around a little bit that I wasn't a huge fan of. Um, but in general, I mean, it's the long dark and I love it. And uh, um, I've been putting a lot of time into it, uh, mostly because one of the things I enjoy the most about that game is mastering the mechanics behind it. So that seems to be what I, that's what I get out of it. You know what I mean? Like I, I like finding the best clothing item and knowing what the best item is because of, you know, weight to warmth ratio and things like that. So um, even though there's been a, a few minor frustrations diving back in, um, I've, I still enjoyed my time. So I've been doing that when, whenever you can't play something, I usually go play the long dark. Or whenever I choose to play something solo like Anno 1800 or something that's not a co-op type game. Yeah, yeah, exactly. It's kind of my, uh, um, it fills it fills a space in the time and, and that's really um, what I've been doing with it over the last, over, over the weekend I played quite a little bit of that. So what about you? What have you uh, been playing in the last week besides Destiny? Anything? Um, I haven't, I, I did start the week off playing Anno 1800 for quite a bit and I've gotten to the point now where I'm on the second world or the new world, like the second region has opened up. I don't know if there are any more after that. But essentially, I've I've established myself in the old world. I've struck out on an expedition to the new world, and I've run into a whole bunch of problems and trouble. And you know, people keep uh, burning down my villages. Um, but amazingly, I'm still at a place of this game where I haven't gotten frustrated yet. And typically, with any sort of city builder or simulation game where there is a potential for things to go wrong, and what I mean by that is so many games, you get the opportunity, it's like, oh, you have now researched a fire station. Mm. You should build one because in 10 seconds, everything will be on fire. And you, it <laughs> just goes from there, which I, I find that incredibly frustrating. Or you get to a point where, you know, religion has been researched and now everybody is terribly upset with you because you don't have any churches yet, even though it's like just become a thing. Right. Um, and Ubisoft has managed to balance it incredibly well, in my opinion, in Anno 1800. So that's been my kind of, it's my Sunday morning coffee game, uh, where I can just sit down and do a couple things and, and finally settled up on a, on a new island because I need to, uh, I think I need to get sugar for some ingredients and it doesn't grow on the island that I've, I'm living on right now. So it's, it's very enjoyable. It's kind of like The Long Dark is for you. It's, the, right. it's a game that you can play and it's like my happy place at the moment. That's good. You need one of those. Everybody needs one of those. I do, and I was thinking when we were talking about Destiny 2, I really wish that Joe would play that game with us, but uh, unfortunately Joe doesn't play on PC, but you must have been playing something, Joe. What What is your happy <laughs> place game? Do you have one that you like go back to? Oh, yeah, and you guys know it already. We do. Yeah, Rocket we League. do. We know. It's, my, it's my Rocket League addiction. <laughs> that is a good one. Yeah, and um, for the record, if there is ever a way to cross-play Xbox and uh, PC Destiny 2, I will be there with you. I will be there. Here's a question. I really, I really want them to do that because I, I wish, I wish Microsoft still owned Bungie. This would already be a thing. See, mm -hmm. what if, what if, what if there, what if we got a PC review unit? That's what I'm saying. If you get a PC review unit, um, we'd it'd have to be set up in a way that uh, matches your comfort requirements as a gamer. I think. <laughs> what does that mean? <laughs> well, I, if if I'm not mistaken, and maybe I'm, maybe I, I had another conversation with another person, but. I think you're more of like a controller in hand, like sit back on the couch kind of gamer, not like at the desk, lean forward, PC, mouse and keyboard kind of gamer. Yeah. I mean, if my habits are, you know, to indicate the answer to that question, then yes. But uh, I mean, I spent a lot of time on, for instance, Starcraft and League of Legends, you know, some years ago. Um, I'm not immune to the allure of PC gaming. Uh, I think kind of life happened and this was the, this was the compromise that I was presented with. <laughs> you know what I mean? Yeah. I, I feel like there are a lot of good and affordable gaming laptops these days that where it's trivial to hook them up to a TV in a living room and use a controller. And you really don't notice much of a difference between that and playing on a PS4, for example. Like yes. It's not a, as big of a deal as it used to be. Several years ago, if you were uncomfortable with mouse and keyboard for shooters in particular, you were kind of out of luck. You know, nowadays, Billy, you play Destiny 2 with a controller. Um, the Xbox One controller is like the best controller you can have on a PC. So I feel like those barriers have all kind of disappeared. Yeah, I I have... Uh... And, and and definitely Sam as well, more so than me. But I will occasionally and more frequently as I play more often uh, beat the snot out of kids online in Destiny Crucible with a controller. And I should be at a disadvantage, absolutely. 
I um I I think part of the problem with with the you know plug it into the TV solution, which is super uh, airtight as a suggestion. <laughs> um, the problem is I have a little bit of what I I have gotten to know you guys over the past couple months, and I have the same uh, mental hangups that you you guys seem to have. Where if you're going to do something, you're going to do it right. And what I mean by that is if I'm going to play a PC game, I'm going to get a decked PC rig. And that's, I think, what stops me from doing it at all, because I'm I'm afraid of myself a little bit. Yeah, uh, if you're going to do it, you're going to do it in an expensive way, but you're going to get the most out of it, right? Right, right. So that's, I think that's the demon that's, that's haunting me right now with PC gaming. Um, all that said, what did I play? Been playing SteamWorld Quest, which... You guys may be familiar with, I think it's on Steam, um, but I'm not hearing a reaction, so perhaps not. It's a game by Image and Form. I have they, to look it up. Yeah, they're they best known for their SteamWorld series, of course, but most notably the Dig franchise, which is like a Dig Dug offshoot. Um, it's, they've been around, I don't know, six, seven years now. And they've expanded out of the dig dug format, which is, you know, like going down into the earth and mining for stones and coming back up and upgrading your gear so that you can go deeper the next time. Right. Mm-hmm. Um, Steam World Quest is an RPG, but it's an RPG light. I mean, you're not like really worrying about stats a whole ton. The real hook of the game is that it's a card based uh, battle system. So you build a deck and you know, each turned based turn that you have, you're given five cards at your disposal and you play them in certain order to deal the most damage, et cetera, that kind of thinking. So it's pretty fun. And, uh, you know, that particular system, uh, that aspect of the game, the battle system is, is pretty, pretty great. Um, came out like a month ago or so and, uh, I'm playing it on the switch. Although again, I do believe it is on the PC and, uh, the reviews are solid and, and I can tell you now I'm like, six seven hours deep that it's it's really great really good one so this is the one where you have different cards from like like your your attack cards your battle cards are based on the characters you've got yeah so depending on who is in your party up to three characters at a time each character has their own cards and you sort of have a deck made up of those three characters cards so you draw gotcha. five or six at a time. I don't. I'm not. I did just hear about that the other day, and and I was considering that as one of my um, potential switch games to take into my summer vacation. Ooh, it's real good. Yeah, real real good. It does look good. I don't think I was just doing a quick look up. It doesn't look like it. Looks like it's exclusive to the Switch for now. Oh, is it? My apologies. Thanks. I, it's just what I'm reading because it just came out at the end of April, correct? Yes, I can tell you that it's. Console wise, definitely only on Switch. I just thought it was also on PC, but shame on me for not looking it up. It, it does seem like the perfect kind of game to play on a Switch. Um, yeah. Like, uh, so I've got a question for you. Like, for those games, like, how long does a typical uh, turn take? Like, a, a typical engagement. Like, if I'm going to sit down and play this, like, what's the minimum amount of time I need to put into it to get something out of it? Um, battle one battle. Uh, four minutes is my guess. Okay. Yeah. Yeah, I do. I do like that because the one hang-up I have with with mobile gaming or Switch gaming in particular is that uh, I I need that to be a fairly uh, short thing that I can do in small pieces. You know. Yeah, I mean, if I'm wrong about four minutes, then it's five. <laughs> I mean, it's yeah, yeah, it's yeah. Short. But I mean, it's not like a twenty minute thing. No, 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 I've no, even, no. I've even played some mobile games on my phone where you're suddenly like, seriously, like I have to keep doing this for another fifteen minutes before I make any progress. It doesn't sure. seem to fit my my mobile lifestyle. Sure, sure, sure. I can definitely appreciate that thinking. I think, um, uh, you know, my my PC equivalent in terms of my downtime is my Xbox, I guess. I know that's for the PC gamers out there. That's like so cringeworthy to hear, I'm sure. But my long form gaming is certainly preferred on my Xbox sitting at the TV. Um, And so when presented with a buying option, right, if I have a couple consoles, I I will strategically get... uh, Games that I've, I'm reading or seem to be more uh, bite size, whether it's like in the full length or in moment to moment, um, I do lean on the Switch for that. And this game does fall in that category. So, mm-hmm. uh, yeah, again, comes with my recommendation for whatever that's worth to you. And uh, it's re- very good. So that actually leads into a, a good segue because it just occurred to me and like a light bulb just went off in my head. You have an Xbox One, right? I do play like you just said. 
I do. Um, Crossplay, Sea of Thieves. Sea of Thieves is the other game that Bill and I played, actually, which seems like so long ago, but it's probably five days ago. Just everything before Outbreak Perfected kind of became a blurry history <laughs> in my brain. Um, well, we played Sea of Thieves a little bit, and that's cross-play, so that would be an opportunity for all of us to play something together. Have you ever considered playing? I have. So Bill reached out to me the other day, and here's a little anecdote for the listeners. Bill reached out to me, he said, uh, Sea of Thieves, any interest, something like that. And I regretfully had to reply with, uh, unfortunately, I get severely legitimately seasick playing Sea of Thieves. I can't, I can't look at it. It makes so you've me not tried it though. Yeah, I have. I have. Yes. Yep. Even if you're holding on to the wheel, because <sighs> um, one of the things I noticed the other day, and and the reason I bring this up is because our friend Dusty also gets seasick playing it. Perhaps not as to the level that you do, um, but I know he's had issues with it before, where it was actually somewhat entertaining for the rest of us. <laughs> I'm sure. On Discord yeah. to be like, Dusty, are you okay? And just hear like, Ugh. <laughs> <laughs> on the other end. That's um, how it sets but, in. I, but I've. I've noticed that if you're holding on to something on the ship, whether it's the the wheel or uh, one of the controls for the sails, um, only the ship moves on the waves, as opposed to your character and the ship, which can sometimes result in this like uh, conflicting moving horizons. Which I, I can see why that would affect people. Yeah. So for for me, and I I don't know that motion sickness is uh, tiered in any way. So I, I don't know if there's like different forms of it necessarily, but. For me, the thing that I've noticed about my motion sickness, and it, and it happens in like the passenger seat of a car as well, I have to see if I am, if my body is moving, right? Or if my eyes perceive movement, then I need to see something moving. And that's my problem with right. Sea of Thieves. Not not specifically Sea of Thieves, but I, you know, I'm sure this would happen with like Skull and Bones or whatever that new Ubisoft game is. Whatever, whatever ship combat game would probably do this to me, right? So no, I'm not passing judgment on Sea of Thieves. It seems like an awesome game. Um, no, I mean, if there is a game that would in, uh, create some seasickness in people, Sea of Thieves should be the one. It does the best seas out of any game I've ever played. There's that, but it's also it's also very sparse. In my short time with it, there is a lot of like nothingness before you, in in certain viewpoints when you're on the ship, yeah. and that's the problem. Like if you're if I see like a, a an island in the distance, and then that island is like slowly moving toward me, even peripherally, then I'm okay. It's, it's very weird, but like when there's like a nothing, a nothingness of ocean before me, that's when I turn into dusty and go, oh, you know. <laughs> so um, while while I appreciate the suggestion of the wheel, I would not necessarily want to participate in something where I had this like major asterisk, like I well, I have to be on the wheel at all times, like to stave off the sickness. Uh, I don't know how feasible that would truly be. However, well, somebody has to pilot the ship at any given time, but I understand it's not. Yeah, the, it, the it is a bit of a shame that it impacts it, and it, some people have that that issue with certain first person shooters and just the way that movement works. Certainly on the VR side, it's a big issue. Oh um, yeah, I um yeah. I booted up. Uh, this is I, I don't know how interesting this is for me to keep telling you <laughs> to keep telling you and our audience how sick I get playing video games, but I I tried to dive into Wolfenstein like the rebooted games. And uh, that did it. I mean, the, I guess the first uh, the first mission on Wolfenstein from you know 2015 or whatever is you sort of like drowning and like trying to make your way out of like a sinking cockpit, right? If you guys mm-hmm. have played and recall that. So I may be unfairly uh, putting like the game engine down, but I find that those like wide view angle first person shooters, of which Wolfenstein tends to be, like a like a quake style viewpoint, like very wide and fast. Um, that always gets me. And uh, yeah, I'm a big wuss. Interesting. interesting. Big well, wuss. I actually have problems with, um, I have, I have, I would say if you and Dusty are, are a 100 or so on the scale, I'm probably a 15 on Sea of Thieves. I definitely have a few moments where um, I don't feel great playing it, um, but it's nothing that I can't just sort of like shake my head and ignore. Okay. Uh, so I can, I can shake it. Like I can just push through it. Um, and sometimes when I go back to the long dark, which I play with the highest FOV I can, I think it's just 100. Um, and I get like 120 frames per second. And I find that when I'm moving around in the long dark, sometimes like for the first hour, if I haven't played it in a while that I feel a little bit 
a little bit nauseous. Hmm. Um, and I've seen it with some other games too. If I go to play a console game, like anytime I've been playing PC for like two or three months and haven't touched my PS4 and then I jump into a PS4 game, I, I definitely notice it. Like once I lose basically 90 frames per second, I'm like, <laughs> oh, wow, that's rough. <laughs> sure. So. Yeah, yeah, and that's why I thought because I'm always uh, the captain when we play Sea of Thieves, so that's why I thought maybe I'm not, I'm, I'm I've been more immune to this because I haven't felt any of that. But maybe it is also a very personal thing. Some people are obviously affected differently by the motion in in games, not just you know ship based games, but any of them clearly. So sure, yep, and cars, real real life yeah. cars. That is, mm -hmm. yep. Well, the reason I thought this might have been a good segue is because Sea of Thieves is, of course, available as part of the Xbox Game Pass, right? Mm -hmm. And which is, I don't know if that's that's how I have it, um, which I love that Microsoft has this subscription model that covers games on Xbox consoles, which I hardly ever touch, but also PC. And so many of those games, games cross-play, like, I think that's an excellent system they've got going there. Sure. Um, and sort of our... I guess our main story or main news story that we wanted to talk about uh, deals with EA talking about that the old way of releasing games doesn't work anymore. And in conjunction with that, expanding their own EA Access subscription model to PlayStation 4. So EA Access those that don't know it's um i feel like on, on pc it's different they have origin access and then they have origin access premiere which basically gives you full games that's almost more comparable to xbox game pass mm -hmm. but ea access is the more like it's the lower end tier of those where you're paying a you know monthly fee and it's something like five dollars a month or thirty dollars a year and you typically get access to games early like you get 10 hour trials you get a couple days early access to titles and this has been around for almost five years now on Xbox One and PC. But at the time, PlayStation said, no, I don't, or Sony said, no, I don't think this is good. Uh, it's too similar to PlayStation Plus, and we don't want to confuse people. There's not enough value here. And for whatever reason, I guess EA and Sony have now decided that, you know what, this is actually not a bad system. It's, it's kind of proven to work, in my opinion, and it's now available on the PlayStation as well. It's cool. Do you, do you either of you subscribe to any of these subscription services? I know, Bill, you subscribe to a couple of them because I've made you or you've made me and vice versa. But um, yeah, I have Origin Access Premiere, um, but I mean, that's an expense, right? So that wasn't really like me buying as, in and as a, as a fan. It was more me buying in thinking that I was probably going to have to play a multiple EA games in a year. So it made sense to have Origin Access Premiere for me. But um, I never did get into EA Access with the 10 uh, where you could play early for like 10 hours or anything like that. Um I don't know if I had to have, I would have, but it was never like as a fan, it never interested me. I didn't, I didn't see that. Um, you know me though. I, I do everything I can to avoid new subscriptions. So. Mm -hmm. Cause they're starting to pile up, aren't they? Like it used to be, I mean, it's the same on the st streaming TV and TV show side, right? There was first, there was Netflix. Now there's Hulu plus there's in Canada, there's Crave, there's, you know, HBO now, and everybody's got their own little thing. CBS has one. So sooner or later, people are suddenly finding themselves subscribed to, you know, three, four, five, six different services on a monthly basis. And um, that's only one side of it. Yeah, that's just... And that's just for streaming content on, the, on your TV. And now for gaming, you've got... Obviously, you've already got PlayStation Plus for some people. You've got uh, Xbox's, Xbox Live Gold, I guess. Is that what it's called still? Uh, uh, I don't yeah. have that. Yep. I don't think. Um, That's basically myself. to play multiplayer games, and you still get a couple of games for free as well. We don't tend to, well, I don't play any multiplayer games on Xbox One, so I don't have that unless I absolutely need to get it. Right. Um, there's Do rumors that? that it's going to be expanded into X, like rolled into Xbox Game Pass. There's, I think it's a little more than a rumor. They said there's going to be Xbox Game Pass Ultimate, or I don't know, what, you know, whatever term they're using, but. Hmm. You know, if if Xbox Game Pass is ten bucks a month now, I believe they said it would be something like fifteen a month yeah. to get the Game Sorry, Pass. I think the rumor is that they'll get rid of the gold and it will just be Xbox Game Pass. I see, I see. Oh, okay, well that'd be that'd be a bold change. Yes. Wow. Um, but I mean, Xbox Game Pass, you get a fair bit of value out of it. I think it's a good service. I only have it via gift cards from I don't even remember where, so I haven't spent my own money on it yet, but. I don't know that I would say that I wouldn't. Um, so far, I've been pretty impressed with the with the library, to be honest. It's pretty good. Yeah, I think uh, what it comes down to is that a lot of people, um, I, I mean, I remember when I 
uh, spent the money on Origin Access Premiere, which was something like, I want to say, 120 Canadian dollars a year, roughly, uh, which seems high at first, but this was just before Anthem was supposed, supposed to come out. And of course, at the time, you know, Anthem was the next big thing. Uh, it turns out that didn't really come true. But at the time, it seemed to me like, okay, so half of that money is just to pay for Anthem because it was going to be included. So basically, if I can find one more EA game in the next 12 months that I would pay for otherwise, I'm covered, right? Like It's basically two games a year or less even. So that seemed like a pretty good deal at the time. I'm still waiting for the second EA game that I can't live without, but it's <laughs> these coming. Are basically, these are basically gym memberships. This is what I'm realizing as we have this conversation, is that when they come out with a subscription like this, they're banking on the fact that you're going to keep paying and not show up. So when they say it's $120, they like make no mistake, they've done the math, and the average person doesn't spend $120. So what they're doing is they're asking for slightly more money than the average EA gamer is giving them in a year, and then the average key, like we might actually show up because we're kind of the hardcore of the hardcore. We would spend more than $120 a year. Right. But yeah. average Joe who just buys it thinking, oh yeah, I'll go to the gym. Doesn't, you know what I mean? Like that's yeah. why I say it's a gym membership. Like you, uh, you know, they, they know that you're going to sign up to go to the gym for a year and the average person and probably, you know, eight out of 10 people are going to go for a month and then just pay the subscription fee and never come back. And they don't care because they've done the math on that and realized this is what we need to charge in order to make more money. Um, and I guess, yeah, I'm very, I'm very negative about subscriptions. So that's going to be a constant tone for our listeners where I'm constantly, I'm constantly down on companies that are asking us for the live service uh, subscriptions. I'm just, I'm not. Uh, it's it's uh, funny because I'm almost the opposite. It's weird. Like I, I hate spending $80 and that's what it's come down to in, in Canadian dollars now on a new game and I really 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 wish that Ubisoft would have a subscription service because well, they seem to be the publisher where I will buy between three and six games a year and if there was a subscription service that was 150 bucks a year I, I'd still save money I would do it for Ubisoft but the difference is, is I go to that gym right so like just to yeah. kind of continue to roll it back to that but I have a history of showing up, right? So it would be it would be worth it in that case. What you're um, saying, you really you got the yoga class subscription, and you're really not that into yoga. Yeah, I don't do yoga. Yeah. So um, with EA, like you said, we're now waiting for that second game, right? Maybe it comes. What is it? Have you discovered what it's going to be? Like uh, maybe it's NHL 19. I was going to say us, the safe one that's... seems to be NHL. They're up to 20 now, right? Was yeah, it it'll, last be, year? it'll be it'll be 20. 20. But yeah, my point is, is that we're starting to get into territory where we might just barely make it over the line. Yeah. Um. So that's sort of a concern for me. It's not a concern because I'm in this business. And again, it's an expense or it's a tax write off. So whatever. But it bothers me for the average person, because what I think is lost is that like I was doing the math. The, just yesterday, actually, when I was talking to my mother, I now pay out over $600 in subscriptions for television per year. Yeah. So if my cable bill was previously $50 a month, I'm now equal to that. So when everyone went, well, Netflix is cheaper than cable. Not anymore. I, th because... I think what it comes down to, though, is if, if that money on Game Pass subscriptions, whether it's Xbox, EA, or some Origin, whatever... If, if it's if that's all the money you're spending, let's say you were to go a whole year and only play the games that are included in these subscription services, you'd probably come ahead. I think where it becomes more troublesome and more expensive is because you get all those, and like you say, you don't actually go, you don't actually play all those games, you still buy all these other games that you want. Yeah. And, I mean, there's no shortage of games out there. Um, then it, it almost seems like it might be more expensive. And that's, I guess, in a sense, I'm not as hard on something like Origin Access Premier as I am when you get into things like the PlayStation Plus and uh, whatever is required for online play. Um, I'm a little bit more into those because as we talked about this um, this new, what what is the new Xbox package that they're rolling out? Uh, well, it's just Game Pass Xbox. Ultimate or something? Game Pass Ultimate. Yeah, the uh, Ultimate, Ultimate or whatever, Ultimate. right? Ultimate. Yeah, the Ultimate. My problem is that that is being sold as, well, if you want to be, you know, the hardcore of the hardcore, you can get this. But mark my words, it is a matter of time until you need it. It is a well, matter of time. That's where we'll end up with if that rumor comes true that they will get rid of the regular gold subscription yep. so that if you want to play online, you now have to spend an extra $5 to get. You get free games with it, but maybe you don't care about those. And right. it was the same thing. Now you almost have to have PlayStation Plus now. You almost have to have it 
in order I, to enjoy. I have it. I haven't turned my PS4 on in a while, but I still have right. it. And I, I've never exactly. been a fan of those. But that's because I'm my my core is that of a PC gamer where I've never had to pay to play with other people. So like that, and this this concept has always been foreign to me. I I get it. I got it on the Xbox 360 when I first got into Xbox Live because its service actually added value. I'm not sure what I'm getting out of PlayStation Plus other than the free games, which I download every month and then never play. Right. I, but, but I have to have it if I want to play like, you know, I played Red Dot Online last or year. Get or get a game update. Um, well, not all. I guess, you know, I'm not sure if game updates are included or not. They might be, you know, you that, might no, they should be fine. Yeah, the, yeah, those but... are free. I actually don't have PlayStation yeah, Plus so. um, just to throw my hat in the ring here. Um, I decided to cancel it. And that was a year and a half ago. And I haven't noticed. I think uh, Jan should should do that. Well, just to try I, it. I just need to remember to cancel the recurring <laughs> subscription. That's really the biggest problem. Like every, I think it's on a three months thing as well. So I'll get an email and be like, it's been renewed. I'm like, ah, oh, crap. <laughs> but I guess that's why that that's really my overall problem that we can sort of like, anytime I'm kind of complaining about subscription services, it's more or less that um, they just never stop asking for more. And eventually what they sell to you as the premium package ends up becoming the required package for entry. So, so that swings into what EA was saying is that the old way of selling games and releasing games doesn't work anymore because I also think that we as customers or consumers of video games are a little bit to blame on that because no longer do we expect a game that has a distinct start and a concise end and you've played it and you're done and you feel like you got your 60 bucks worth. We now want games that we're married to, that we expect there to be new updates, ideally free ones. God help us if there's microtransactions, because we don't like that at all. Um, but there better be a, a, a year one roadmap. There better be continuous progress. But we really just want to pay the 80 bucks up front. And I think EA has a valid point when they say, that's not really working. Like, I feel like the reason they're all pushing towards subscriptions is because we're expecting continuous updates. I don't think so. I think they're pushing towards subscriptions because they know how to make money off of us. I don't think it's I don't think it's a matter. I don't think people have a problem with paying for DLC. Like if you were to pay 80 bucks and then they said and then $40 cuz this has been the roadmap for the last 10 years. You paid your 60 to 80 dollars depending on what country you're in and then you paid your 30 to 40 dollars um depending on what country you're in for the DLC. I think that what is happening here is that publishers are seeing that okay, well we've hit we've hit the ceiling of what we can earn in profits under that model. And obviously, as a company, profits have to continue to go up. So we have to think of a new way to sell these games. And we have to make we have to have consistent and continuous revenue streams. We can't depend on a big launch in May where everybody pays their $80 and $40 for the, the expansion packs. And then we get another one in September. We need that game that comes out in May to be relevant and to earn revenue consistently from May, June, July, August and carry us through. I think that's what's happening. I don't think it's the consumer. Joe, what, what, what's your opinion? Because I feel like, I mean, I, I don't disagree with Bill. I think that there is a part to be played on both sides. For sure, the publishers constantly have to come up with more earnings and find new ways to make more money out of, you know, the same or less work. I mean, we talked about Crunch. Uh, we talked about Fortnite just last week and how the expectation there is. And of course, that's a free game, free to play. And they make tons of money off microtransactions. But on the other hand, there was high expectations for Anthem, which... It does feel a little bit shady that EA is using that as an example because it feels a little bit like covering their ass where it's like, this didn't work out well and we realize that now because blah, blah, blah. But like, is there a happy medium in there? Like, is everybody to blame a little bit? Is that, or maybe our, our subscription's just the way to go and it's good? Well, I, to me, like, is this really necessarily directly, let, let, for the sake of discussion, right? Let's just use Anthem if that's cool. Is that really like a subscription related topic or more so about, uh, you know, relay it to, I remember before Overwatch came out, there was a, there was a good amount of time, or at least it felt good. I actually didn't participate in it, but I remember my friends participating in this thing where they got to a really good feel for what the game was going to be. And maybe that's, uh, unique to Overwatch, which, you know, kind of infamously doesn't have a lot to do in the, in the way of modes. Right. So it's like, you kind of saw the extent of the experience during that uh, beta. But when it comes to like an anthem, which is similar to a destiny, right? It's impossible to see everything or get a feel for, you know, the quote unquote end game experience and how, you know, how different is 
playing with a fully stacked character versus playing with a completely empty character. Those are those are things that I don't know that you really can get ahead of. Do you, know, do, do you guys agree with that? Like, how could you possibly simulate the amount of time it takes to get there? Well, I think one of the one of the potential solutions, and this is where I think it connects into subscriptions in my mind, anyways, is that EA has mentioned what they do in uh, certain regions is that they do a lot of play tests, they do a lot of soft launches, they do a lot of you know getting the game into the hands of people so that they have more feedback. It's almost like a, a high level version of early access and and that kind of thing. But I also feel like for a publisher who wants to make money from those games, like. You can do that with games that rely solely on microtransactions, where the game is going to be free. But if you have a game that you don't want to have those microtransactions and your plan is to sell it for a certain fee, even if you have $30, $40 DLC packs in the future, it's really difficult to get that game out into soft launches unless you've got those people already paying for it in some way, which is where I think subscriptions come in. Yeah, and I sure. like when I was reading through, like obviously we all did our research on these topics, and when I was reading through some of the articles on um, how EA says that the old way of releasing games doesn't work, I, I had the same thing as you, Jan. I immediately thought subscriptions because I'm going to be the one who consistently says, how are they going to try to capitalize on this? They're not sitting there thinking, how can we... They definitely want to make it better for the gamer. Don't get me wrong. I believe that. They want to make the experience better for the gamer, but only because they want to be able to monetize it better. So now it's going to be a matter of, well, you know, you get the ultimate edition of this Xbox whatever, and that will allow you early access to games, for example. Or, you know, if you have Origin Access Premier, you can participate in betas. But if you don't have it, you can't participate in betas. So they're going to monetize this. When they're talking about doing soft launch, which I kind of interpret personally as play test betas and, you know, early access for um, seeing things like that. And Joe mentioned Overwatch. And I remember watching people play Overwatch long before it came out. Um, and I think that was a great example. Mm -hmm. um, th EA is going to monetize this. Not just EA, but anybody. They're going to monetize this. They're going to figure out that not only are we going to do something that allows players to kind of get in and find out what to expect, we're going to we're going to charge them money for that. And it'll be rolled into some kind of subscription that people have to pay for. And maybe that's how they, you know, maybe that's how they separate Origin Access from Origin Access Premier, for example. I don't know. I mean, but. they've already got, Microsoft's been doing this with all their stuff, insider programs for everything, right? There's a Sea of Thieves mm -hmm. insider program, Halo insider. I mean, they, they do it for all their software, not just games. You can be Microsoft insiders for Windows releases and stuff like that. I just wonder that at some point, that scale of these previews and these insider things, will they always keep that free? Or I think in their eyes, it's going to be, well, if you have a subscription, it makes more sense to let ins insiders slowly ramp up to the full game. It's not a, a sudden cutoff between, okay, well, that's the first you know mission or two that you got to play because that no longer is enough to properly test things on, on these large games. Because to your point earlier, you know, you, you can't, if you've got hundreds of hours of end game how, how do you get people to test that right 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 and i think i i, I more see what you're what you're saying now in, in regards to how the subscription kind of kind of you know plays with the psychology i guess of <laughs> of of being a game renter as opposed to an owner and how that how that really actually could change how i felt about anthem where if i'm already on ea access i wasn't i did buy the game you know like from best buy just for the record but if i mm -hmm. was already on ea access the entire psychology of the of the experience is different where yes i might be disappointed in the game but i'm probably not taking the twitter and you know ranting about it because it didn't really impact me very much at all right i didn't like it didn't make a new transaction for that game it didn't cost me anything i was already in you the were environment already part of this ecosystem anyway so you were right. already paying for stuff to come your way eventually and anthem came and it wasn't great and i i, I know that this has been suggested several times as to how they could have done it better was by doing some sort of early access, right? And giving it more time to stew and improve. What do but, you guys um, what do you guys think of the now in my opinion, it sounds like ancient history, the World of Warcraft model, um, going back to like what if what if Anthem was a buck a month, a dollar? Like Yeah, I, I, yeah, that's cuz it was it's interesting because World of Warcraft did that originally and I don't remember what the monthly fees are but didn't it used to I be like I think it was 10 like 10 or 15. Bucks? Yeah, it was a lot. Yeah. I don't think you could get away with that anymore now, which is why I think these are all these passes and bundles because you can get somebody to pay you 15 bucks a month for more or less all your games. Um but I feel like World of Warcraft they managed to do it because it was 
one of the early ones. This was before all the other stuff. And people who were paying for it back then, I think they now have ways to earn that money in game and they're kind of hooked on it already anyway. Right. I would do it for Destiny. Um, but that's because you're hooked on Destiny as well. You've got yeah, exactly. Your, yeah, but I think that this ties like we're now tying in old episodes of podcasts because if you if if companies were to switch to that model where you're saying oh well give me fourteen ninety nine a month and that's it like there is no Destiny three it's just Destiny and it's going to continue to be Destiny and, and evolve from there. Um, I think first of all the Destiny community specifically would absolutely love it and second of all that would probably be a factor in creating that crunch that we've discussed before. Mm -hmm. Because now you're really on the hook to earn that money and not lose those subscriptions. You could make yeah. the argument that you're, yes, you're on the hook, but you're also, you have a direct revenue stream from the people that are asking for the thing you're making. And and in that yeah. way, it's easier to to staff up for that kind of work. Hopefully. And that's assuming the suits then, you know, are willing to staff up and not just take the money and run. But yeah, I agree. Like it could, if handled properly by by the big bosses, it could definitely be a positive thing. So I would prefer... Suits that. and financial people love subscription. If you can get money on a regular basis, no matter what you actually do, mm -hmm. it's like that's that's like the end goal. That's the best thing ever. Sure. So, um, yeah. the one thing, the one last thing I want to bring up with this real quick, because um, I I love the discussion on this, and but we have some new games to talk about as well. But the one thing that I wanted to bring up with this is I find it ironic that EA's best received game so far this year followed a model that's completely the opposite of what they're talking about here with of course apex legends where it nobody knew about it it was just announced it was like here it is yes it's free to play yes it has microtransactions but there was no testing there was no soft launch it was just like finished game there yeah and it was great was i think yeah, also was. like the major <laughs> like the super I, I almost important feel like bullet they're point. saying you know we should have done it this other way that was really just a fluke yeah 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 yeah, yeah. But it, well, really, though, like that's a good studio. Exactly. Right. Like a Apex can can get away with the crimes that's <laughs> it's uh, uh, that have happened because it's so good, you know, and Anthem wouldn't be the, you know, negative press story that it is if it wasn't for it sucking. <laughs> so it's all relative. Yeah, for sure. To, yeah, to the game. If Anthem had been a success, we wouldn't even be talking about this. Mm hmm. All right. One of the things I want to mention, as you know, we are sponsored by Audible. You can get a free audiobook if you visit audibletrial.com slash push to talk. And in order for us to lead into our new segment, which we are calling New Game Plus, where we talk about new games that were just announced or released that we're excited about, my weekly recommendation for an audiobook is basically anything written by Tom Clancy, such as the Jack Ryan series of books, Patriot Games, The Hunt for Red October. Many of these you've probably seen as movies over the years. And of course, he was also responsible for Rainbow Six, which kind of relates to the first game we're going to talk about in the next segment. So, Bill, you came up with this idea for New Game Plus um, because we thought, you know, we talk about what we have played. We talk about some of the big stories in gaming. Let's talk about what we're excited about that's coming out soon. It was just announced, something like that. And this week was actually perfect because we had several big announcements. And uh, why don't you tell us a bit about the first one, which relates to Tom Clancy, of course. Uh, yeah, absolutely. So Ghost Recon Breakpoint is uh, the one that was announced. Um, and as you know, and others will come to know, I was a massive fan of uh, Ghost Recon Wildlands because it is a four player co-op. It is a shooter. Um, it takes into account tactical. It's a huge open world. Just just everything about that game was my kind of game. Uh, so I was very happy to see the Breakpoint announcement. Uh, it looks like it's going to have have obviously uh, very um, similar uh, mechanics to what you had with Ghost Recon. It will again be a four player co op as an option. Um, and it's again going to be, you know, trying to um, fight your way through a new territory, although this one is not a real location, it's a, it's a made up location. Um, but again, looks like it's going to take into account abilities. Actually, looks like it's going to have more hardcore survival elements in it than it had in the last one, such as, uh, you know, if you get shot in the leg, you'll limp. If you get shot in the arm, your aim will be affected. Uh, you might have to build a camp in order to recuperate or uh, whatever the case may be. I don't know the details on that too much. Um, and you can carry your, your buddies to safety to heal them and... You know, you can cover yourself in mud for camouflage and, you know, but 
Also, with all the Ghost Recon abilities, and I'm sure there'll be a skill tree that you can sort of explore and, and craft your character the way you want. Um, it'll have that stealth gameplay, that stealth aspect. And uh, I think for our gaming group, it's probably the biggest excitement that we've got coming so far this year. Don't you think? Yeah, I feel like obviously Anthem fell flat. Um, the Division 2 we had fun with, but I feel like we've kind of played our way through it. And for whatever reason, even though this is similar to The Division 2, and in fact, Breakpoint might be more similar than Wildlands was, it, it, it this seems to have more of a cohesive like story and, and purpose when we play it as co-op with the four of us. Um, I do wish that this was cross-play. And I mean, they haven't talked about this at all, but if history is any kind of indication, it will not be. Yeah. Because I wonder if Joe would enjoy playing this on Xbox. I think I with would. Us on PC. I think I, yeah. yeah, I think I would. We get right into it, too, um, or with Wildlands we did. And I just played through Wildlands for a second time solo because I couldn't convince anybody to join me. <clears throat> well, I do um, want to join you because there was that new content update, which we haven't got to yet, but it leads into Breakpoint, which was sneaky of Ubisoft. Well, yeah, that's true, but I was playing it before that. I was just playing it to enjoy it from you know its original form. Um, but you've said numerous times you don't you don't replay games unless they have new stuff no, so. not typically no yeah so but it's we get right into it with the um having somebody on like overwatch as a sniper and then you know having someone kind of go in close quarters and the sniper cover them and just just coming up with a plan and trying to execute it and quite often it goes horribly wrong we just end up in a great big gun battle <laughs> but when it happens and when we pull off you know the plan and we we execute properly it's it's one of those gaming highs for us so and i feel like those things are actually going to become more important in breakpoint because as you mentioned it's a little bit more realistic uh you have to be a little bit more organized if you play as a team which by the way when you play solo you no longer get ai teammates so solo is actually a solo experience so i think the co-op experience is going to be the most fun because we're going to be able to have different classes you can switch them at any time, but we can actually specialize. So if you just said someone's going to be the sniper, you can actually be that sniper-specific class and you get some extra perks. So that's where it leans a little bit more towards the Division 2 than Wildlands did before. And I, I can't wait for this. I It's coming out in October, and that month is already saved because we'll be tired of Destiny 2 stuff by then. And it, this is excellent. Can't I, I'm really looking forward to it. And you know, it, it's got that familiar face, and this is why we have to go back into Wildlands, and we should do it this week or the week after, um, because that small free update they introduced last week, which added a new character, Cole D. Walker, who plays alongside the characters in Wildlands, but he ends up being the, the main antagonist in Breakpoint. So I, wa I want yes. that, that origin story. Mr. Shane from The Walking Dead, or Punisher from Netflix. Um, what is his name? John something. John Bernthal. Bernthal, yeah, yeah. I think he was probably a good choice. As uh, he seems like a good antagonist, uh, antagonist for a shooter. Yes, he does. Yes, uh, Joe, is, is this the kind of a kind of game that you would play solo, or is this one that you would be like, I gotta have three friends? It's the kind of game that I think I just. Uh, simply... I don't mean to imply you don't have three friends. I mean to imply <laughs> that you need three friends to play this game with you. I do. I do have three friends. There, uh, they haven't mentioned this in our group chat, so I don't know if it's on the radar and on the radar. Um, no, this is just the kind of game that I probably would only enjoy uh, co-op. I don't know that I'd ever want to play it solo. So Yeah, because I think some of the f most fun moments are those, you know, totally. Dusty screwed this up moments or so-and-so <laughs> you know, made a mistake. Poor Dusty. And, well, we got to use somebody. <laughs> you could make up a name. He knows his role. He knows his role. I could make up another name, yes. <laughs> Uh, it does look it does look good at a glance. Um, and a, another uh, point I wanted to bring up is there is a render of the actor from uh, The Walking Dead. I don't know who that guy is, but I assume you know who I'm talking about. Yeah, yeah. I mean, it looks incredible. It's like it, it does look good. Yeah, that's one of the best uh, like digital recreations of a human I've ever seen. Well, and they've had really, I mean, the one thing I do like about these sort of sequels is that they build on a lot of uh, well-earned experience with this type of game. Because just like The Division 2 improved upon The Division and its couple of years of updates, uh, Ghost Recon Wildlands got several years worth of free updates. And, and that, of course, includes a bunch of learning by the developers, a bunch of feedback from the community. So I, I feel like these games, when they make a new one, they tend to get better with time, which... Ironically, I don't really see that so much on the <laughs> Destiny side, but sure. 
Ubisoft seems to have that down, where they release a game, they they nurture it for a couple of years, they keep improving it, and then they make the next one, and it actually includes all of the good stuff that they learned from the previous one. It's the way Probably it should be. Yeah, so I would agree with that. It's the way it should be. And I think it's going to be pretty good. I'm very, I'm very hype for this one. I, now, speaking of hype, I know, Joe, you're very hyped about this game that you're... Uh, that's been announced this past week, and that's Final Fantasy VII's remake. It is, yeah. And I, <clears throat> I want to make sure. Did we talk about this last week? No, we didn't. Okay, good. Uh, yeah. So, full disclosure, I did not ever play Final Fantasy VII as a youngster. Didn't have it. Didn't have a PS One at the time. This is um, shocking to me. I yeah, I could understand not, why not that because, would be shocking. Because of, I mean, a little bit because of the type of games you enjoy. But I just thought. That one of the reasons you're so excited about this is because you have played it in your youth. I I was going prior years (laughs) in my youth uh, as a as a little being. We're all old. We all have a youth behind us. It is behind us. That's for damn sure. I think that I'm interested in this game because I haven't played Final Fantasy VII. Now I know that like the general reaction to the Final Fantasy VII remake is positive. You know, so far it's been pretty positive. So I'm I'm not trying to insinuate that. You know, people are sour on this or anything. But I think if you grew up absolutely loving Final Fantasy VII, then you're going to probably be way more opinionated than I'm going to be about this thing. And yeah, as with most remakes, right? Yeah. Right. So I think that that's why I'm going in totally unbiased. I'm seeing a what looks like uh, industrial, you know, setting in uh, a. coupled with a battle system akin to final fantasy 15 which i really really enjoyed i know i'm like a little uh uh, in the minority on that but um yeah between the visuals the setting and what looks to be a similar battle system to something i've enjoyed in the past it looks like for me something that i'm going to love and uh so yeah this past week we got a short uh teaser uh that did two things it showed us some updated visuals because the last time we saw this thing at all uh there was some commentary about you know (laughs) the the size of cloud's arms i remember was like a hot topic on reddit um (laughs) yeah among other things uh right down speaking of being more nitpicky about stuff (laughs) yeah give me a break um and that was like that was like early footage and it was like well known that it was early there was like really no cause for concern but of course there was plenty of concern So we saw updated visuals, which if either of you have uh, watched the the, uh, accompanying video to the story, it really looks awesome, I think. It does. It does. And I'm similar to you. I never played Final Fantasy VII. I've dabbled in Final Fantasy, and at the time, I was... I was always a fan of the the real time combat, so this sort of turn based combat, the Final Fantasy style combat, didn't appeal to me. Mm-hmm. But I watched the trailer, and I'm similarly to you. I'm thinking this would be a great sort of game to get into and try out. Give like give it another proper chance, you know. Mm-hmm. Um, I'd be curious for you to check out Final Fantasy 15 because it really played the way this looked. Um, just at a glance, I mean, it, you know, the, the the editing was so bombastic on purpose. So I'm really like pulling that out of my butt, but I just, I'm assuming like it's sort of in that vein just because, I mean, why reinvent the wheel? They actually like pulled off like a pretty stellar um, RPG action combat, which is so hard to do. I mean, that's like, that's the holy grail of what Square Enix has been trying to do for 25 years. So um, yeah, so again, uh, they uh, released some footage for us to see. Um, and uh, if you've listened to this podcast over the past couple of weeks, you know that I need to see gameplay and we got some gameplay, which is awesome. Um, and then they said, look forward to more information in June, which is an, uh, another another really smart way of saying like, yeah, this isn't too much for you to sink your teeth into. Uh, also, if you have a negative reaction, which, which I didn't, if you have a negative reaction, we got plenty more to talk about real soon. So... Um, <laughs> I, I do like that there's like a very close horizon of more info for this thing. Yeah, and do you, do we think that June is E3 or are they going to do their own thing? Because Square Enix, I think, is one of the one of the few publishers still going to E3. <laughs> the Square Enix is going. Um, uh, this title is unique in that it is a Sony exclusive release, and yes. uh, oh. <laughs> we won't see Sony at E3. So I'm That's unsure right. if that means anything in regard to when we'll see it if it's e3 prior or after or during or whatever but um yeah i mean my money well they have a square enix does have a tendency of doing their own little 
uh, keynote, right? I think they live streamed it. It was just a live one last year. So they maybe they'll show something during that. Yes, but they it's, also have, if I recall last year, it was the worst of the batch. So they, they've been known to disappoint as well. So I could see that. I could see them not showing it. And and then you know some Twitter rep coming after the Square Enix press conference say oh we we weren't allowed to show the Final Fantasy VII remake that's a Sony thing and they're not mm. showing anything you know I'm just I'm just putting it out there as a as a possibility for how things might shake out so I'm currently looking at the Sony store on my phone and I I, I search for Final Fantasy XV and I'm confused because there are 18 matches. Um, they go all the way between clearly add-ons to sixty dollars for the royal edition bundle, um, and also a free a King's Tale Final Fantasy fifteen. I don't know what I, like. Help me uh, out, Joe. Uh, a King's Tale, I believe, is a like two D beat 'em up game. Okay, so let's scratch that off. Don't want that. All right, I'll probably I'll have to look into this sometime. I mean, there's Maybe there's the there's edition. two there's two games to concern yourself with. There's Final Fantasy fifteen, no colon of anything after that, and then there's Final Fantasy 15, I think it is Royal, and I think that's the Game of the Year edition, if I'm right. not mistaken. That's that's probably the one you want. Um, however, I haven't played any of that content. I can't really vouch for it. Um, if you spend 20 bucks on this game, that's an incredible value and uh, and uh, a decent price for it. So that's cool. So we get to look forward to that in, in June, and I, I do like, like you mentioned, that, that they're telling us when to expect more, and it's not way down the road. I mean, exactly. June is just a couple of weeks <laughs> away from now, really. Yep. Um, the other new trailer that we got to see, including a release date, and I think, Bill, you're excited about this, is Monster Hunter World Ice Iceborne, which is coming out later this year as well. Yes, I'm, I'm very excited about Monster Hunter World, but I never stop being. Um, Monster Hunter World, I think, is probably... Um, the best example of a game that is designed and um, has the loot system and the combat system that I really love. So I I am very excited for Iceborne. I mean, to be honest, though, like if you said, let's play Monster Hunter World tonight, I'd be excited and as is excited. I guess what really gets me excited about this is that you will play it again. Well, here's my question, because and I don't remember this, but did you, do you only play it on PS4 or did you ever switch to the PC version? No, we played together on did PC. We, we okay, together. I don't remember yeah. that. I remember playing it on PS4. I don't remember if we ever did it on PC. You know, well, if you, this will ring a bell then, because um, I played ahead on PC, and for some reason you couldn't join me. Uh, so you joined me after a while, and I was already leveled, and we uh, both agree yes. the campaign is not great. Right. Um, so I just killed everything and pushed you through the campaign ultra fast so that you could get to the actual game. True. I remember now. Um yeah, and and really, I mean, every complaint that we have about the loot system in 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 our marriage to Destiny is not a problem here. You know, um, you know what you need and how to get it, and there's interesting in multiple ways to fight each monster. And like you know, for example, like I need a tooth off of this Anjanath in order to make this sword. Mm -hmm. You know, so you go fight an Anjanath in one of like 20 different scenarios that you can fight an Anjanath and you work on breaking its face so that you can get its tooth kind of thing. And I, I really enjoy that. I, I know what I'm doing and every mission that I go on, there's a purpose. I don't feel like I'm grinding. Like there, I am grinding, but with a level of control. So yeah, Iceborne, um, I mean, I saw the trailer like everybody else and, you know, I've kind of paid a little attention online, um, new monster, but I'm so behind on monster hunter world that I, it's hard for me to get hyped for new content because there's already new content that I'm not playing. Yeah. And it's coming out on um, September 6th on the PlayStation four and then Capcom yeah. is targeting a winter release for the steam version. So nothing too specific. Oh, then I don't need to care right now. Yeah. Um, yeah. At All least that tells it's not me a year I have later. More time. It's, it's not as far off as it used to be. True, but this will give me more time to actually go back and play some Monster Hunter World, um, just individually if I need to, and you know maybe progress my character and try some new content and stuff like that. So yeah. By the way, both this and the Final Fantasy VII remake were announced at Sony's State of Play on uh, May 9th. and of course, you know, like Joey just mentioned, Sony not going to E3 and. Instead of that, they're doing these little state of play things where they sometimes they're literally 15 minutes of pre recorded trailers and announcements and they just push them out every couple of months and there you go. What do you, do you, is this a good way to do it? You guys like that? It's good for me. I mean, 
I, I don't need the big stage show myself. I don't think they do it well, honestly. Um, I think that they're trying to essentially copy Nintendo Direct, which is if I'm awesome. being honest, Nintendo Direct. Yes, like I, really, they, really. Fun they are. Is, Nintendo yeah. Direct is awesome, but I don't think Sony's coming even at a quarter the the uh, no the quality as Nintendo Direct. That's my problem. Is that well, for example, with the, this state of play at Shack News, we were watching it and obviously reporting on things that that popped up, and they announced a PlayStation, a new PlayStation. Mm -hmm. <laughs> um. I forget what it's called, but it's the it's one that the has the Days of Play edition. <laughs> right. We had to like Nobody knows through. what it is. No. That's my point. Like you're announcing you're like, here's a new PlayStation, and then everyone's like, wait, where? Yeah. Is what it really though? About? Or is it just a thing? Like, is that an it is it? Looks like a limited edition base it's just, PS4. It's just the skin. It's honestly, got rounded like corners. It's like somebody took a square image and just rounded it a little bit <laughs> and said, There you go, here's your Apple icon or something. Well, isn't that but just a slim? Physical. Isn't that just a that's slim not PS4? My problem. Sorry, I, I think the the actual uh, shell of the console is just the PS4 Slim. I thought I I don't know. Honestly, See, this is where the confusion comes in because I saw an image of what looked like a PS4 Slim with a different logo on it, but also rounded corners. Now uh, I don't know if that was just uh, marketing material. So I think we can agree that since several days later we still have no idea what this thing actually is, that they probably <laughs> didn't do a very good job of of like. Yeah rolling it out yep this, right, this is worse than the xbox one s all digital edition where we went like wait a minute what is it and why definitely um so i think that i like the idea of state of play i did i'm so far not sold on their execution i don't think they're doing it very well i think that um they need to watch a few nintendo directs and that would probably help them out yeah, yeah. those are excellent yep I, per I personally like it because you at least you get little bite-sized things and if you have a busy day and you can't watch it live at least by the end of it you're just like oh okay so new monster hunter new final fantasy 7 sweet couple trailers i can watch them great on the other hand ghost recon breakpoint was announced through a ubisoft live stream that they teased days before with a, a date and i actually watched the whole thing for i think it was about half an hour of, of gameplay footage and trailers and people on a stage and but what i do like is that these companies have sort of reverted back to let's pre-record something and we'll live stream it but it's not an actual you know live event so that you don't have some of those awkward live things that we've seen on stages before they'll often have like a Q&A session with community after that's live but that's more casual anyways i don't know i yeah, i like I, that. I, agree. I don't mind the idea you just just do it well or don't do it yeah it's been a good week for new game announcements Certainly. and having said that i think uh, you guys have any final clothing closing words of wisdom advice uh, for me, it's don't count out the turn-based games. It's just the feeling I'm having after talking to you guys right now. You shall give them a chance. Bill. Wait a second. I well, I'm a huge Civ fan though. Well, that's good. So, yeah. So I don't. I, I don't know. Now I have to fight you on the next episode because I don't know why. I don't know why you're taking shots at my turn-basedness now. Oh, I'm not. I, I'm saying. I'm coming I away this from this. Fight. Yes, you are. <laughs> yeah, there's, there's a fight. It doesn't matter. Now there's a fight. I'm coming away from this show just feeling uh, much love for the, for the genre. That's all. And I just wanted to express oh. that. Well, that's good. Yeah. I don't really love the genre, but I do love civilization. So you weren't totally wrong. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. If you were taking shots, but you weren't. I wasn't. Wrong, so. I wasn't. Well, we'll find something to fight about in the next episode, which will be released the following Tuesday. My final words are to let people know that you should check us out on the website, pushtotalk.fm. And you can follow us on Twitter at Push to Talk FM. And of course, you'll find us on all the various podcast systems, iTunes, Google Play, Anchor, Pocket Cast. There's a whole bunch of them. There's a whole bunch of icons on the website. I'm running out of room. So basically, wherever you're listening to podcasts, search for Push to Talk. You should find us. Thank you so much for listening.